Welcome to the Arena Decklist Podcast. I am Jerry Thompson. Joined with me every week is Brian Gottlieb. I hope you are doing better, my friend. I'm doing great, Gerald. Actually great. I am running again after many weeks of illness and not being able to exercise. I feel about 95% at this point, which is awesome. I'm stoked. You feel great, but it's also in comparison to how you have been feeling, right? So it's it's possible, you know, you're definitely yes. not 100%, right? But No, I, I am down from where I was. And that was noticeable on my run today as far as stamina and just like moments where I was like, oh, I should not be breathing and coughing like this. But <laughs> still, I, I will take it after weeks and weeks of arduous recovery. Uh, we take our victories at this point. Love to hear it, man. All right. So we have some Theros beyond death previews a lot of them uh mm-hmm. over 100 cards at this point anything else you want to talk about or do you want no, to just get right i don't want to talk it? about i don't want to talk about anything else i want to talk about theros i feel like we've been very patient in the past we stretched the preview season over a lot of shows and we're trying to condense that a little bit we really only want to do one show before we head into our top 10 list which we were also going to do a little bit different this time do we want to tell people how we're going to approach that this go around I think rather, so before I thought it was cool that we each make our top tens in secret and then we reveal them to each other and we get to have that discussion. But now Mm -hmm. we are actually going to get together at some point, discuss it beforehand and try and come to a consensus top 10. And I think that will not necessarily be as entertaining, but it will likely lead to better data. Right. I agree. I think it's going, the the way we did the shows before was exciting. It was fun. It let us argue a little bit, but I want to prioritize accurately identifying the best cards in a set. And that's what we're all here for. At the end of the day, we want the best information to come out and fun is all well and good, but we got to get it right too. And I think this is going to let us assess things a little bit better. And those things that there's been a lot of times where after we do our show, you and I talk a little bit, or even on the show, we talk a little bit and we change each other's mind a little bit and we come together and we have a point of like commonality where we finally understand how each other are looking at the card. And we're just going to do that ahead of time this time. So we can get to a really, really solid top 10 list. Right. And when we're having those discussions, normally I have, you know, some shell of a deck in my mind or you do, or you have an idea of how a certain card is going to shape the format. Like Cavalier of Thorns is one that comes to mind mm-hmm. where I read the card and did not necessarily see your vision for it. Right. So we get to meet up beforehand, have those discussions. Maybe this is something we should record and just like give to patrons, you know? Ooh, I like that idea a lot. Yeah. Let's do like a, a special pre-show discussion type thing that'll be for patrons only and then we'll do the polished version the regular podcast and everyone gets to hear the end result yeah so they can they can hear us arguing if they want to and then going deep on like well here look at this deck list or whatever you know and and then we can just do the nitty-gritty top 10 here's why here here's what we're thinking this is why we agree etc very nice idea cool all right starting with there us beyond death if uh y'all want to follow along you can go to scryfall their homepage if you scroll down a little bit like right under the search bar they have theros beyond death ongoing previews and then for this we sorted by text only and sorted by color and i'm basically just going to go through the list and you know we'll talk about the the cards that we think do things right and if we we miss something i mean so be it hopefully we'll figure it out by next week we'll get it in the top 10 show All right, first up, Banishing Light, two dub enchantment. When this enters the battlefield, exile target non-land permanent and opponent controls until Banishing Light leaves the battlefield. So, reprint, good reprint. I like this one. Yeah, welcome back, Banishing Light. We have all felt the pain of our prison realm not answering exactly what we want it to. Banishing Light just dealing with any non-land permanent in in an enchantment-based set. Always happy to have this card around. It's nice to have catch all answers at our disposal. Well, since it is an enchantment based set, I would imagine there's going to be some enchantment removal. Yes. Of course. Of course. There's downsides. Yeah. This is, if you think that this card is a little too good on rate for standard, which is, you know, kind of a joke with how they've been ramping up power level and everything. I think that this Mm. is a good place to put a card like this where there are likely going to be answers to it also. So it, it does diminish the power level to a certain degree, but 
three mana to basically answer anything, and maybe you have some enchantment synergies of your own that you can take advantage of is pretty sweet. Yeah, and we all know white very much in need of the help right now. So good for white to actually have a good catch all in every form spell. Every yeah, form for sure. All right. Uh, next up, Daxus, Blessed by the Sun, Dub Dub, Legendary Enchantment Creature, Demigod. It is a two power star toughness. Daxus's toughness is equal to your devotion to white. Whenever another creature you control enters the battlefield or dies, you gain one life. We have to start redoing our assessment of mana costs where usually this dub dub mana cost would be a huge downside on a card like Daxos. This is a feature, not a bug at this point. You want those pips showing up. This will obviously be part of devotion strategies. And that big back end is going to matter in a bunch of spots. This card doing a very nice job of holding the fort against aggressive decks to say nothing of that passive life gain, which will certainly gain you some points throughout the game. I don't think this is like a world beater card, but it does seem like white is still leaning into the life gain themes. There's a bunch of this stuff going on. We're going to talk more about cards that are quite strong, actually, that have some life gain potential. There's also plants. If you go back to Throne of Eldraine, there's the white, white, white legend whose name I can't even think of right now because nobody ever played it. But, but there's good setup for this type of life gain setup. Of course, there's a Johnny Pride Mate type stuff going around. There's the Johnny Planeswalker, which actually makes a Johnny Pride Mate still floating around. So there's a lot of stuff we can do with this. Historically, not of a constructed power level. This tends to lag behind. But when the life gain stuff is good, it's really good. We certainly saw good Soul Sisters decks do the job in the past. So let's see what Daxos can do. I'm, I'm pretty into this card. Yeah, I am too. I mean, Legendary is obviously a drawback, but it's one of those things where it's like, if they want to get through on the ground, they're going to have to kill this thing. And these Devotion decks are going to have to look at what the best possible enablers are. And Daxos being two pips for two mana, I think it just means that it is going to be one of the best enablers for any sort of other devotion thing you want to do. And on its face is just a 2-2, which is reasonable for two mana, but it's going to scale very quickly and get very big. Yeah, this is going to do efficient blocks. And you think about how uh, four toughness is such an important breakpoint in the format right now, usually because of Nissa tokens. I think Daxos will usually meet that hurdle and provide some staunch defenses. And then, of course, the devotion payoff in this set, it does well with life gain. We're going to get to that god in just a little bit. All right, next up, Elspeth Sun's Nemesis, two dub dub, legendary planeswalker Elspeth, five starting loyalty, minus one, up to two target creatures you control, each get plus two, plus one until end of turn, minus two, create two, one, one white human soldier creature tokens, minus three, you gain five life, and escape four dub dub, exile four other cards from your graveyard. You may cast this card from your graveyard for its escape cost. Escape might be my favorite mechanic of all time. It does just feel like in the context of standard, it is going to lead to basically no one ever running out of gas and games taking forever, which we already kind of had that going on with food. So I don't know how I feel about this. I'm reserving judgment because I feel like people are looking right past the second clause with escape. The mana cost is fine, but the exile for other cards, like when there's this type of qualifier on a card, I feel like we always just go, oh, it'll be fine. We'll be able to cast this. And I think of like drown in the lock, which people expected to be quite good in standard and, oh, this card will always be on. And it's not, it, it, it's not always something you have access to. And there's a bit more squeeze than people are giving the escape cards credit for at this point. So I, I'm not as scared as you are. I do think you'll be able to occasionally get rebuys on stuff and it's going to be very good. But if you look at the power level of something like Elspeth's Son's Nemesis, it's down. And that's not to say I don't think this is a powerful card because I'm leaning towards yes right now, although I will openly admit this feels like the hardest Planeswalker to evaluate in quite some time. And Planeswalkers are historically very, very difficult to evaluate. So that's saying a lot when I'm giving Elspeth's Son's Nemesis credit for being super hard to evaluate. I need to put this card onto the battlefield before I really understand it. But just on its face, this does seem to be a little bit down from what we expect at this point for a four mana Planeswalker, even I guess a three mana Planeswalker, because those are just completely insane these days. Elspeth on its face, not doing quite as much and only ticks down too. 
Yeah, but I mean, she's she's probably not going anywhere. I, I would imagine the exile claws being difficult in white because they typically don't have a lot of self mill. And it's also not the card or the color where you would want to do things like play uh, golden egg is like the first thing that comes to mind, right? Where it's just like, well, you can play this at kind of a low cost to fill your graveyard or whatever, uh, just as like a sort of cycler. And this seems like an aggressive ish card to me. Like obviously you can use the tokens and the life gain as more of defensive things. But I just look at this, like you, you play, Elspeth for four mana, you get two one ones, and then next turn you can do kind of like the history of Benalia thing, right? It's just like start threatening with the pumps and against some sort of control deck, or even, you know, your opponent plays in Nissa and makes a three three. Like you now you have two three power attackers, which is pretty good, especially considering there's a lot of other things that you could have been doing in the first few turns, right? So like you can have a pretty wide battlefield from this card and the power pumping is, is pretty nice too. Elspa seems pretty strong to me actually. For four mana, you get this Planeswalker that sticks around and also gives you a bunch of value leading later into the game. And the minus two to make two tokens gets to threaten like this history of Banalia-esque thing where you then get to start minus one-ing and just like hitting your opponent for a lot of damage, which I really like. And against anyone with planeswalkers or a dry battlefield or whatever. I mean, Elspeth left unchecked ends up being really just a lot of damage. It does. I agree with you. And there's this uh, like very clean pattern of minus two, minus two, minus one, escape minus one again to really put a lot of damage on the battlefield out of just one resource, like you're presenting 12 damage from just one card spread across four creatures, which is really good. Now, granted, that's very slow, very mana intensive, but it keeps scaling throughout the game. You can do other things with it. You have the versatility of the gain five, five life aspect of Elspeth. So my instinct is that this card is going to be a solid part of standard, but I'm, I'm not willing to bet the bank on that at this point. I need to play games with this card for sure. Yeah, I mean, the, the problem to me looking at all these cards is like, uh, but they're all white, you know? Like, <laughs> right, what do you what, play them with? Uh, yeah, so we'll we'll see more of that, I would hope, as more of the set gets previewed and everything. So I'm not going to immediately discount it just for the sake of it being the, the worst color at the moment. It, if anything, it leads me to believe that the worst color can now become a playable color. I hope so. I mean, white has so much ground to cover. It's kind of unbelievable how far behind it is in comparison to the other colors. I know. Uh, well, this this should help. Heliod, Sun Crowned, two dub, legendary enchantment creature god, five five, indestructible. As long as your devotion to white is less than five, Heliod is not a creature. Whenever you gain life, put a plus one plus one counter on target creature or enchantment you control. That's weird. On target creature or enchantment. I think that's so you can juice up Hilliard while it's not yet a creature, right? Yeah, it, it just <laughs> reads It's funny. weird, yeah. One dub, another target creature gains lifelink until end of turn. So obviously the bulk of our discussion here hinges around standard, but I don't think you can talk about this card in fairness without mentioning its potential impact on older formats. So you get to weigh in now, Gerald. Do you believe in the combo that everyone is talking about, Hilliard plus walking ballista to instantly kill your opponent ish i mean it's easily broken up by every single thing ever but i, I don't know man sure like you, <laughs> that was you a can, very very strong endorsement of this plan so you can play this as a backup plan in your devoted druid deck or whatever but like that combo even though it's effectively a three card combo right because the two card combo only gets you infinite mana you still need a way to kill them but like you can use this to have like combos on combos or just have a backup plan or whatever, or you can make a brand new sort of like court of calling Eladomri's call deck. But I, I just don't think it is necessarily better than the things that exist. It is to very, totally agree. It, it is very man intensive. Totally agree. I think it is worse than existing options in modern, but there is a second quote unquote eternal format at this point that is pioneer where I do think this card is quite meaningful in conjunction with walking ballista. One of the good things about 
the Heliod combo is that it's a very, very small package. This card is apt to be fine in a bunch of like white aggro decks. You can do stuff with, we have Boros Reckner, right? Does the format yep. go back that far? Yeah, we yep. have Boros Reckner. Uh, there's obviously other three devotion stuff. Yeah, you can play Reckoner, Boros Charm, Azorius Charm, man. You can, you can just do it old school. That sounds pretty good to me. So there's a few setups you can look at with Heliod in Pioneer. And then I just think like infinite combo in Pioneer, usually good enough. The format is powerful, but generally not quite that powerful. We just said goodbye to one infinite combo in Pioneer with Felidar Guardian's brief jaunt through the format. Uh, Maybe Heliod is headed the same way. I don't know. I don't want to go that far yet, but I will certainly 100% be building around this card in Pioneer, I think it'll get the job done there and be part of the metagame. Will it be a problematic part of the metagame is the only thing we really have to answer at this stage. Yeah, so Boros Reckoner, Heliod, Boros Charm in combat allows you to gain infinite life, right? Because Mm -hmm. you can give the Reckoner lifelink and indestructible, and then if the Reckoner gets dealt damage, oh, I guess you get to put infinite counters on it too but it's getting blocks is that's not really a big deal, but like, yeah, you get to keep shooting the reckoner and then re-triggering the reckoner with its ability and it never dies because it's indestructible. Also Boros charm, Boros reckoner and Torbran is already a thing that like some of the red devotion decks are doing in pioneer because sure. Torbran makes the damage go up every time. Yeah, that's cool. So that's, that's an infinite kill too. So yeah, I don't know. Maybe, maybe my boy Boros reckoner gets to come out. I, that, that would be exciting for me. I don't know. I didn't think I would get tricked into playing that card in 2020. I have a long history with that card. I love it quite a bit. I've done a lot of goofy things with it. Uh, I know you scored your first Pro Tour Top 8 with the assistance of Boros Reckoner, so I imagine it's a card you have firmly in your heart. Yeah, did did you get like started on this train because of Bobby Sapphire? No, you're going to have to explain to me what's going on there. Oh, uh, okay. It's it, it's one of the gems. Okay. The gem, the gem brothers, and he like Bobby Sapphire was the one who was playing Boros Reckoner Blasphemous Act on Moto before the Gate Crash PT. Oh, okay. Like he was the first person to to do stuff with it. So, yeah, immediately I started thinking like, oh, can I play Harvest Pyre or do I get do I get a Blasphemous Act? And that card is not actually in Pioneer. Turns out, big sads, but yeah. Uh, a lot of other stuff going on with Boros Reckoner. Like you mentioned, all these combos with the charms. Maybe that's the way to go. I don't know. I don't know. I, the goal, I think, for the Heliod deck is building a reasonable deck that also has access to the combo and maybe some ways to search it up, you know, some sort of Court of Calling-esque type of thing. But just trying to build, like, an actual combo deck between the two cards does not seem feasible to me. What about just playing white aggro? Like something yeah. uh, like what Sam Black... Sam Black didn't win the PTQ, but came up with basically a mono-white aggro deck won one of the early Pioneer PTQs and just throw Heliod and Walking Bliss in there. I think Walking Bliss was already in the deck. I don't think it was. It was like a very aggressive Knights deck that had uh, Heron's Grace Champion. But right, if you right, right, if right. you want to do devotion-y things and then you have Nykthos, then Ballista's obviously just going to be fine on its own. Yeah, I mean, Ballista's a fine magic card. It's it's found homes all over the place, basically. Right. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me if it finds another home with this card. Uh, you will get killed by this combo in 2020. Not not you specifically, Brian, although I do think that yeah, I probably you, will. you will also get killed by it. But like people in general are going to get killed by this and it is going to be a thing, but I don't think it's going to be like, you know, Splinter Twin, 20% of the format, et cetera, et cetera. So. What about Standard? Do you think this card has a chance there? Yeah, this card's fine. Uh, this is This is a reward for... Gaining life, making your things bigger. This is a card that lives through a lot of the sweepers that exist and everything. Like, if there is a mid range white creature deck that's like Daxos, Heliod, Elspeth, like Heliod is going to be part of it for sure. Yeah, I like this as just a meaningful attacking creature in standard. And again, the life gain setups are very good. There's plenty of cards where you can benefit from these triggers and just start throwing counters all over the place, really. So, Hopefully, Heliod is the key piece for White being a player in 2020. Healer's Hawk, let's get it. Yeah, I would not be surprised to see that card in the battlefield. Actually, lost to a Healer's Hawk today. I was not expecting that when I queued up. But Justice. Such is life. Yeah. Your, your, your opponent is from the future. Yeah. 
All right, next up, Idyllic Tutor, two dub sorcery, search your library for an enchantment card, reveal it, put it in your hand, then shuffle your library. Uh, this card was like a million dollars because of commander and formats like that, but you are the person who's doing like weirdo doom foretold stuff. Uh, are you excited about this at all? I kind of buy this card. I'm I'm not over the moon about it, but there are several powerful enchantments in standard doom foretold, as you mentioned, but fires of invention. I mean, we started playing F Sphinx of foresight so we can consistently find our fires of invention because the deck is so anemic without it. Now, maybe you just play for idyllic tutor and then you have eight virtual copies and you can go get banishing lights with it as well to have answers to other problematic cards. So I, I could see a potential home for idyllic tutor alongside these powerful enchantments to say nothing of all these new enchantments would be coming out of this set. Yeah, I don't think I would play four because Idyllic Tutor is pretty bad post fires. It's not great. I mean, you can fundamentally change the deck where you have more large payoffs, things like Ethereal Absolution or, I mean, what other big payoffs do we have right now that are enchantments? There's got to be at least one more. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm sure things exist. I haven't actually done an enchantment search. I was just going to wait for more cards to come out figure out what I'm Sounds actually safe. building around. But yeah, adding two copies of this to Fires makes a lot of sense to me. Maybe maybe four, I don't know. One of the things I will certainly be testing early on, and I hope it's enough with some other cards that are going to show up to do something for Doom Foretold, because I would like to play that card again. Doom! Our next card is a one-dub enchantment saga. Sagas are back. I, I like sagas. I don't know. They've, gro they've grown on me. All right. Yeah. Was it chapter? They're, they're chapters, right? Correct. All right, chapter one, search your library for a basic planes card, reveal it, put it into your hand, then shuffle your library. Chapter two, create a colorless zero four wall artifact creature token with defender. Chapter three, gain two life. Uh, overall, three very, very small abilities, but for two mana, I don't think that this is bad. If we go back like 10 years ago, this is my number one card in the set. Like I'm just going nuts about this card. <laughs> Magic has changed quite a bit over that period, but I, I do think these are, like you said, three small abilities, but in concert, this card actually does quite a bit. And if you're playing some type of control deck, what do you want to do? Hit your land drops, stay alive. That's what the entire game plan is for control. This deck does that beautifully. If you can get some other synergies, you mentioned Doom Foretold. It's tough to get the timing right with this and Doom Foretold, but it's certainly possible uh, if you're able to sacrifice it before the two life trigger goes off. Maybe that's a, another plus towards playing this. Of course, you can't sacrifice that wall because it is a token. Let's not forget how Doom Foretold works. We did that when the card first came out. Oh, Don't yeah. Don't want to be on that road again. But yeah, I think this is like a fine combination of abilities. It automatically pays for itself by going and getting that basic planes right off the bat. So I'm into this. I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing with it quite yet. Maybe it's important for something like blue-white control. That That's plausible to me. That deck didn't do the best job of dealing with early aggression. And it had to hit all of its land drops because it was super reliant on something like Gadwick. So this checks a lot of boxes for a deck like that. Yeah, I like this. This, this card makes a ton of sense to me. It's like... Any sort of mid-range value-y type of deck, I think, can do something with this, especially if they have a way to get use out of the 04 wall. Either it's like maybe just blocking for planeswalkers, or maybe you have some sort of sacrifice outlet or whatever. You know, like there's there's a lot of ways to utilize something like this. That all sounds good. Revoke existence, one dub sorcery, exile target artifact or enchantment. Uh exile is kind of nice and just two mana disenchant. I'm pretty pleased with this. Yeah. With uh, escape around, this may matter more. Exiling yeah. could be a big deal. I can't think of anything off the top of my head that you really want to exile right now in standard. I'm sure there's something I'm blanking on, but this card has mattered in the past. It may matter again. Yeah. And we have literal disenchant at the moment, but uh, this gives us some options and obviously makes sense in context of like the limited format and everything. So Makes right. sense for it to be here, kind of like Banishing Light. Yep. And uh, that is it for the white cards. So currently, I think white is still in last. What do you think? We're not there yet. There's some <laughs> options that are starting to show up. We can, consider, right we can consider building white decks again, which is something we have not been able to do for a very long time. So That is true. Good first step. Uh, do you like Ashiok's Erasure? I think it's worth mentioning. It has some flaws, but it does clean up some issues, one of which would be uh, Shifting Ceratops. All right. 
Ashiok's Erasure to you, you, Enchantment, Flash. Thank you. When this enters the battlefield, Exile target spell. Your opponents can't cast spells with the same name as the Exiled card. When this leaves the battlefield, return the Exiled card to its owner's hand. So this gets blown up. They still have to recast their card. So you both spent some amount of mana. So it's not like a huge tempo loss or anything, but it is like fairly annoying if it gets blown up, I guess. But yeah, I didn't know if we want to talk about this card or not because it doesn't seem great, but cards like this are usually meant for a specific thing. And I'm sure that there's going to be a point where it's like, oh yeah, obviously I'm sideboarding two Ashiox erasures or whatever. Right. That's my bet as well. And if a deck shows up, which is reliant on a specific card, I mean, Fires doesn't quite get to that point, but you could see how this card would be problematic for them at some points. I mean, again, I think they will have outs to it and they will be able to answer it. Uh, But being cut off from something like Fires or even one of the Cavaliers could be pretty impactful for them. But this is around to do a job. It's nice that it catches Shifting Ceratops and I expect to see some play, not a lot. Yeah, fair enough. Next card is Glimpse of Freedom. One U instant draw card, escape to you, exile five other cards from your graveyard. A lot of cards that 10 years ago, me would be super, super stoked to cast Glimpse of Freedom. Definitely one of them. Obviously calling out Think Twice. In some ways worse, in some ways better, because you can escape a bunch of times, as many times as you want. Uh, I don't know how often you're going to be able to successfully do this in a game. Like I said, I think people are underrating this escape cost. There's only so many times you can exile cards from your graveyard. But it wouldn't surprise me if a lot of blue decks pick up one copy of this card. I think that's almost always going to be correct. More. It it depends. You want more copies? It depends on how many other escape cards you have vying for your for graveyard sure. as a resource. So in something like Blue White Control, there's obviously going to be some tension between Glimpse of Freedom and Elspeth if you decide to run both of those. And certainly drawing multiple copies of this card is somewhat useless. But... Think Twice generally was a card that was used for velocity early, just ensure that you hit your land drops and have ways to use unspent mana and everything. And I think this card is going to do a very good job of mostly just keeping that tradition alive. Because right now, like if if you just don't do anything on like turns two, turns three, like the, the blue decks don't really have anything to do with that unspent mana. And right. This this is a game changer, and because of that, I would actually want multiple copies of this. I'm thinking like two or three. Uh, you probably don't want four because it's a little bit clunky, and it doesn't pay you in the same way that Think Twice did. But I look forward to drawing like three cards over the course of a game with this card. I think that's very impactful. Oh, for sure, and it's something that people are going to sleep on in the early days of the format because it doesn't seem like it should be game changing, but filling out your mana curve, like you said, can do a lot. Five cards continues to scare me. And I think about how blue white presently deals with things. It doesn't do so with spells in a lot of instances. Right. It's using things like banishing light or, you know, brazen borrower is a card that comes to mind as far as how blue white is built. Now, some of that's going to have to change. We talked about, what is being called legend of the leftover nog. That's the saga that does not have a name yet. Uh, That itself will end up in the graveyard at some point. So there's a card for your glimpse of freedom to eventually eat. Also let's not forget fabled passages around. So that's juicing things a little bit. Ops Ops another nice one. Yeah. Yeah. So you put all these cards together. Opt and Fable Passage were the two where I'm just like the, the first escape is not going to cost a whole lot, but yeah, especially for five cards. I mean, like you have 60 cards in your deck, right? Like <laughs> how many how many times can you realistically escape this even if you go down to decking, you know? Right. So you're going to be able to escape this once, maybe twice, in super long games, maybe a third time. But really, that's about it. But that that's worth it to me. I think so too. I, I don't know if I'm up to like three really scares me. One or two is definitely going to be the sweet spot for a glimpse of freedom, I have a feeling, because two mana draw card is really far below rate. That's going to come up some hands really badly. But you want to find one at some point in the game. Yeah, and you will. But it's also kind of weird because this is like very incremental advantage and the blue-white decks are like Agent of Treachery U or Mass Manipulation or Gadwick and 
you mostly just kill them by going over the top. But again, I do think that this helps smooth things out in the early game to the point where it, it's important. It matters. You know, it's it's very similar to playing Ott, right? Right. And I think the blue-white decks do have to change. I mean, there's a reason we do not see the, de- the deck in the present metagame. So that setup is not really working for them right now. They need a new trick. Maybe Glimpse is part of that. Maybe. Nadir Kraken. One UU creature Kraken, two, three. Whenever you draw a card, you may pay one. If you do, put a plus one, plus one counter on this and create a one, one blue tentacle creature token. So reasonable mid-sized creature that is a mana sink also has two blue pips. I don't know what the blue devotion rewards are yet. The blue God has yet to be previewed, but this seems solid. Yeah, I want to know more about that card in particular, understand if these Devotion Pips matter. It's weird. You don't get the immediate impact you want out of a three mana creature. And there's some good three mana options presently that play a little bit more in the present mode of magic. Again, this feels a little bit older to me in a lot of ways. There's a lot of cards in this set that feel that way. I think this is ultimately going to miss unless the blue devotion setup really can take advantage of this card and then maybe it'll shine. Well, imagine scenarios where you play this on three, somehow it lives. Just like getting this card bounced is a tragedy also. This is very bad mm-hmm. against Brazen Borrower, but mm-hmm. you you want to have draw your card, pay a mana, you play a land, you, you play new think twice, you pay another mana, you have a four power thing, two tokens, like that's pretty great, right? Yeah, that's good. Or on turn five, you play this and like cast opt and activate it, you know, like there, there are situations where this scales better the longer the game goes because you actually have the mana left over. So even if they do deal with it, you might get some, some one ones out of the deal. And hopefully there is some way to actually make those meaningful. But right. I see ways in which this is not just like a three mana creature that doesn't have an ETB. Therefore it's unplayable. And it especially changes when you look at how, these decks will likely be doing things on like turn one and turn two that your opponent probably has to answer also. So uh kind of opens the door for this to actually live and allow you to untap of it. I like your point about what the one, one creature is actually going to get up to. Like, are there ways to take advantage of that? Are there going to be like Biden of Thassa type effects where you just want a bunch of small bodies and you benefit from that in some fashion? Uh, that's the thing I really need to know about this card. Still a lot of unanswered points. This card has to see play, though, because I, I want people to have to use tentacle tokens. It's just funny to me. I think that opens a weird door, and I'm already it does. concerned about it does. custom I'm, tentacle tokens. Yeah, maybe maybe not custom ones, you know? Okay. Everyone but, has to use the default tentacle tokens. There's no room for creativity on this card. Yes. I'm glad. I'm glad we have agreed to that. Yeah. Okay, we'll just move on. Thirst for meeting. <laughs> to you, instant draw three, then discard two cards unless you discard an enchantment card. This card is good. More old feeling cards. I love it. Uh, obviously a call out of Thirst for Knowledge, which you and I certainly remember as a top tier card. Like that card dominated for a long time. Is it still restricted in vintage? I don't believe so. It was at one point though, right? I honestly don't know the answer to that question. Okay. It was it was restricted or banned somewhere. Um, this card was extremely, extremely powerful, and many, many decks took full advantage of it. They now have to play enchantments as opposed to artifacts. I do think that's generally, if we're going into older formats, a bigger hurdle to cross, but in this standard, I don't think that's going to be a problem. I would expect this to be a feature of the format as well. Yeah, I agree. I mean, this is another way for theoretic blue white control deck to exist and have ways to filter and the fact that this exists means that you're probably not playing three copies of glimpse of freedom right you're probably playing like you know two and some thirst or one and some thirst but Mm -hmm. it depends but yeah like thirst discarding a banishing light against a control deck and like now your hand is full of lands so you can make your land drops for the next few turns i mean that's that's glorious yeah, I also want to point out early on in Eldraine, there was a lot of reanimation going on and those decks did not pan out whatsoever, but people were very excited about them for a moment. Uh, maybe this card juices those archetypes a bunch and we can finally reliably get our payoffs into the graveyard, start rebuying those agents of treacheries and things like that. 
I'm excited about that, but I wasn't going to mention it because I just assumed that I would try it and it would not pan out. I don't know. The, re- the reanimator spells are fine. I think, what is it? Barter and blood? Is that the black one I'm thinking of right now? I may be misnaming it. Blood for bones? Blood Some for kind bones. of ghoulish name. Thank you. Blood for bones. I think that's quite a good reanimator spell. It asks for a bunch of stuff. Like maybe you need to play Merfolk Secret Keeper in order to enable it. But oh, that's that's what we use tentacle tokens for. We sack them to blood for bones, clearly. Okay, sure. Whatever you got to do. Uh, however you're getting that buyback. I think that's a powerful, powerful magic card, and it hasn't quite had the chance to shine yet. So maybe it will with the addition of Thirst for Mimi. All right, on to black. We have Ephemia the Cacophony, 1B legendary enchantment creature, Harpy, 2-1, flying. At the beginning of your end step, you may exile an enchantment card from your graveyard. If you do, create a 2-2 black zombie creature token. This, This card does a lot of stuff. I'm just really happy that you are the one reading the card names because I feel like a lot of the cards in this set are just designed to make me mispronounce them. Like someone at Wizards is trolling me knowing I will have to say these card names at some point. No, it's on me. I mean, I I think I'm okay at pronunciation, but... Yeah, no, you're you're much better than I am, 100%, without question. I'm certainly going to blow some stuff uh, at various points, but this one, I think I nailed. Yeah, you nailed it. And I think this is a card that also nailed it. I am unclear about what we're supposed to be accomplishing with this, but it does play well with Thirst for Meaning that we just mentioned. So maybe there's a setup there we can look at. Uh, I need to know more about zombies. I need to know more about like how we're juicing graveyards. We're going to talk more about that as we move through these black cards. But Ephemia has some nice stats. It's very, very cheap and repeatable 2-2 black zombies. We've seen this trick before. There's a, usually a lot of ways to leverage that. Yeah, and I think for the most part, it's just going to be they had to kill your enchantment creature and now you get zombies, right? But if you are doing self-mill things or the game has gone on for very long, then yeah, you could get a zombie every turn potentially. But I think, you know, the first few turns that this thing is around, it's just going to be a 2-1 flyer, but that's completely reasonable. It's fine. Yeah, absolutely fine. We've seen Order of Midnight do a good job in that role. Sometimes you just want that early pressure. It matters a bunch to get on the battlefield and then future copies can be the ones that really take over the game. Yeah. So I like this card. This is, you know, reasonable, early, aggressive creature and it scales well into the late game, which is basically all you can ever ask. Yeah. And we have things like dead weight. If we need to really lean hard on enchantments, like it's not the best removal spell, but it answers goose. Um, There's other two toughness creatures that matter a lot in this format. So maybe you start leaning more in that direction just to make this card matter. Yeah, maybe. Uh, next up, Cling to Dust, B instant. Exile target card from a graveyard. If it was a creature card, you gain three life. Otherwise, you draw a card, escape, three B, exile five other cards from your graveyard. So uh, you exile a non-creature, it's cremate with escape. Uh, so kind of similar to like the think twice sort of thing yeah. where yeah this, with more it, utility yeah this this could it's a little bit more expensive on the back end but a lot of these cards have to deal with graveyards and this is a very cheap potentially main deckable answer like this card is nice yeah I think this card is good I don't know if it reaches back to older formats. That's always something I think about when we're looking at graveyard hate. It tends to have to be a little bit more explosive most of the time. I don't think the single target disruption is really going to be what you play for, but like black draw a card, that's that's good. I'm, I'm happy to have that in my deck. And like you said, as you get to the late game, this can really scale effectively, uh, especially in decks that like want to leave up a bunch of mana in the late game anyway. If you're just representing Counterspell, you're very happy to spend four as opposed to three on your Cling to Dust versus the Think Twice card. So so I like this card. I, I think it'll see some level of main deck play early on and then maybe fade to the background a little bit when the decks get a little bit more refined and you don't have to just account for everything and these reanimator setups fall out of the format a little bit. Yeah, with, with Oko gone, Cat Oven decks usually are just chilling with one food, right? Mm -hmm. And this actually is a way to interact with the cat in a way that is meaningful and good. But obviously, if there are multiple foods in play, it doesn't really do a whole lot. But, you know, then you can go after something else and just like cycle it to draw a card and look for a different sort of answer. So that that kind of solves one of the problems that we had already. 
Yeah, cat is a challenging card to answer. I also want to mention that card as I do my preliminary builds in this new format. Cat oven is squeezing a lot of the space that I would otherwise like to play with, uh, both in terms of like what it forces opposing decks to do, and just like if I'm building a black deck, it's probably got cat oven in it. I think it might be a mistake not to play that setup, and then that pushes you in a bunch of other directions, and it's squeezing a little bit of the creativity in uh, specifically that color right now but really it's a limiting factor on the format and i think it's one everyone should stay aware of as you're brewing in the early days yeah it's it's not even really affecting my black decks too it's like you you look at the the simic uh like adventure self mill deck that strosky was playing last season for a little bit mm-hmm. and it's like okay you care about artifacts and milling yourself maybe you should play some ovens and then probably just play some cats and maybe you just have a discord outlet instead of trying to cast them or whatever you know you just try and self mill into them and now you have things like thirst for meeting to actually yeah, that's cool discard them so that that shell is is very good very strong are we headed to uncastable cats do you think we'll see that at some point uh that's been a staple of a lot of my deck list already wow very nice <laughs> Uh, next up, Erebos Bleak Hearted, Cat's Best Friend, 3B, 5, 6, Legendary Enchantment Creature God, Indestructible. As long as your devotion to black is less than 5, Erebos isn't a creature. Whenever another creature you control dies, you may pay to life. If you do, draw a card. 1B, sacrifice another creature. Target creature gets minus 2, minus 1 until end of turn. A lot of things going on there. All of them seemingly enjoying when a cat heads to the bin. Uh, we've seen this trick before. If you can turn your sacrifices into more cards, things get out of control very quickly. It's not quite the same as Korvald where things just go bonkers and you're completely unlimited. This does have the life limitation, but obviously Cat is paying for some of that. You'll have some food around. This card seems better in those setups than it does in the devotion setups where I've actually mostly passed on this card just because I think the pips are super important because of cat oven on the other side i think you're incentivized to have huge gray merchants as opposed to just small gray merchants right. so my devotion setups have passed on erebos but like you said i think this might be a meaningful part of the cat setups yeah two life is a good gate for this uh creature you control dies draw a card thing and just like w- whenever you play a uh, cat oven deck with midnight reaper like Midnight Reaper is very powerful, especially once you get the sacrifice thing up and running, but it also comes at a huge cost. And I definitely envision points where you're just going to say no to Erebos. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's it's cool that you may pay two life to draw a card rather than it being a must. But this this card is powerful. It does a lot of things. Like if, if you have some creatures lying around, this makes combat very awkward for your opponent, can potentially draw yeah. you a bunch of cards. Again, lives through sweepers. This does a lot of stuff. Can you imagine Oko in this format, though? No. I can't imagine Oko in any format, quite frankly, so that that just doesn't really change anything. Like, I I guess these aren't creatures until your devotion is there, but then it's just like, uh, Oko, Elk, your god. It's just, uh, come on. Never, ever, never want to have enough devotion where (laughs) Oko is able to do its thing. Well, Erebos plays around it, right? Because you get to sacrifice whatever creature is turning Erebos on. Yeah, yeah, turn it off. That's nice. Great Merchant of Asphodel, another reprint. 3BB, Creature Zombie, 2-4. When this enters the battlefield, each opponent loses X, where X is your devotion to black. You gain life equal to the life lost this way. This card is powerful. It is good. Obviously, it matters how good the devotion-enabling cards are and like how many pips they have and everything like that. They're good. They're zombie, really good. Zombie creature type might matter. I, I will note that... This card was a staple of Mono Black Devotion in the very beginning, but the later versions of the deck ended up playing more powerful uh, cards in a vacuum over Grey Merchant at the end. And I think that was fine for the context of that format. But in this format, where I expect battlefields to get bogged down and cat oven things to be prevalent, I just want to talk about the Mono Black Devotion curve as I see it. Uh, First of all, you get to still play Cat Oven, which is great. I start with Cauldron Familiar. I have my oven. Then you can go into Yarrick's Fen Lurker if you have to. I I have a feeling there'll be a better 
two black pip option along the way. You have Ayara, which the first cat oven decks I ever played were just cat oven with Ayara. That was extremely, extremely powerful. You can then go to Deathless Knight, which is four pips. And with all this life gain going on, you'll often be returning that Deathless Knight. Yep. And then you get to cop off at Grey Merchant of Asphodel. So if you just no, 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 no. In that what, fashion. What's what's the real cap off? If you want, you can go to Bolas of Citadel as yeah. well. And then just chain through yeah. your entire deck. Yeah, yeah that's right. I mean, that, that seems promising. Obviously, the curve has gotten very high at this point. But still, there's there's something there. You're, you're drawn cards and, you know, paying life, gaining life. I mean, you can, you can get to six mana. You also have Castle Lockthwain in case you somehow ever run out of gas. With the higher mana curve, it's unlikely that it is going to matter all that much. But even when you're talking about going through like Bolas' Citadel turns, it's like, oh, you don't like the top card of your deck. Well, you have a castle to help filter through it. And then... You can oven away the gray merchant to make two foods, which mm-hmm. gets you closer to 10 things to sack. And it's, it's good. Yeah. Yeah. I think these decks already look promising and there's a whole lot more cards to come. I, I think I'm comfortable calling murderous rider, the best removal spell in the format. Obviously yes. you get that as well. It plays well with your devotion theme somehow. I think Cas- castle Lothwain is the best of the castles, even if it hasn't shown quite as brightly in standard, we see it doing an awesome job in pioneer, really enabling the black decks and, this is my starting point. Like if you're looking for a new deck that I think is very, very good, mono black devotion is already there to me. Yeah. Yeah. That's, it is interesting. I, you saw the deck that I put out that was like green, black cat oven, kind of like splashing gray merchant. Like I just, I played a couple copies or whatever. And you're just Mm -hmm. like, dude, play the deathless Knight, go all the way, you know? And, uh, that's, that's certainly a possibility that that might just be better. So my article this week, was about this card whose name I'm presently forgetting. How is that even possible? How do I write a whole article about the card? Allure of the Unknown is the name of the card. And I was talking about that in these devotion setups as opposed to Bolas of Citadel. But I, I had a devotion deck in that article that was just exactly that curve. And I'm thinking through it. And I'm like, this is so powerful, so resilient. You can put so much card advantage into this deck as well if you want to. Like Allure is a very clean, very easy splash. And the thing about your devotion cards is they don't play well for your opponent. Like there's just not a lot of facially powerful cards in the deck, but when they all mush together, they're really, really strong. Cat oven pieces on their own don't do a bunch. There's yeah, uh, Ayara, right. which is only good when you're really taking advantage of it. Something like Deathless Knight looks silly because it's going to die and then come back for you. So <laughs> I was high on Allure of the Unknown with these setups, but there's so many ways to build this deck and they all look very strong right now. Yeah. Midnight Reaper and Erebos are another two fine options if you want to go that route. And sure, Allure is Rakdos, right? Allure is Rakdos, correct. Yeah, so you can have access to Mayhem Devil too if you want. So yeah, you got a lot of options. Mm-hmm. All right, shall we continue? Let's move on. I could talk about Grey Merchant all day. There's so many good devotion decks to build, but I'll let you continue. Okay, uh, Meyer Triton. 1B, 2-1, Zombie Merfolk, Death Touch. When this enters the battlefield, put the top two cards of your library into your graveyard and you gain two life. Uh, two mana for a 2-1, like Goblin Piker stats are never impressive. Uh, we talked about the legendary harpy earlier and like flying matters a lot there and also being able to make additional creatures, but like death touch means that this is probably going to trade with something. And it's like, you get a little bit of self mill and to life like this, this is reasonable depending on what you're trying to set up with it. Yeah. A whole bunch of little bits of value sprinkled onto this card. Maybe this is part of these reanimator setups we're talking about. Don't know. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me that this card sees play though. Timurit calls the dead. 2B, Enchantment Saga, Chapter 1 and Chapter 2 are the same. Put the top three cards of your library into your graveyard. Then you may exile a creature or enchantment card from your graveyard if you do create a 2-2 black zombie creature token. Chapter 3 is you gain X life and scry X, where X is the number of zombies you control. So 2B, you get some self-mill, probably two zombies, and then a little bit of value on the back end. Probably two zombies is the part that concerns me. I mean, I think you can build your deck in a way that you're you're right. You're probably getting two zombies, but it's not a certainty and it narrows exactly what this is going to do. And I haven't seen the support cards to enable the pure timer it calls the dead 
deck, the fact that we're not getting any kind of reach out of the third part of the saga. Like I, I expected there to be some burn attached to that. Right. Like you gain X life and do X damage. It's not there. You just get a scry instead. And I understand why it's not there. This would be a very powerful card if it had some damage built into it. I don't know that I buy this as all that powerful. It depends how badly you need to get cards in your graveyard. If you do, this will do the job for sure. Yeah. Black history, Benalia. No, I'm kidding. Uh, yeah. History was good because it turned the tokens into something relevant. It made them threatening. Uh, this requires you to have some other sort of payoff. But right. three mana for two two twos over the course of a couple turns and some additional value is not bad. It's just I, I got to know what to do with all that stuff. Right. Yeah. On its face, it's, it's not good enough. Like there needs to be some synergy holding this all together for it to be worth it. All right. Uh, last black card, Woe Strider, 2B, Creature Horror, 3-2. When this enters the battlefield, create an 0-1 white goat creature token. Sacrifice another creature, scry one. Escape 3BB, exile four other cards from your graveyard, and Woe Strider escapes with two plus one plus one counters on it. How many of your devotion or sacrifice decks has this made it into? Sacrifice decks quite often, and I have to do something real quick. Please forgive me as I do this. That's the alarm going off, Jerry. There, there's an alarming bit of text on this card. It's sacrifice another creature, scry one, no cost to do so. No gate. And that is, that is something that always is going to pique my interest. Always makes me say, hey, what can we get up to with this? I don't have all the answers yet, but this card is powerful enough that you're incentivized to figure it out. Free sacrifice outlets mean a lot. There have been past standards where this would have broken things wide open. And I haven't quite parsed out how this standard is affected by Wolf Strider being part of it, but I have a feeling this card is quite good. Yeah, I do too. I mean, it, it comes with a friend and it mm -hmm. comes back from the dead as a very large creature. Yeah. Five, four. Like <laughs> this, this card is just good. It has too much text to not be good. Love these cards just loaded up with line after line of exciting text. Uh, this one, at least there's a, a bit of a puzzle to figure out. Like you want to do more than just play it on its face, I think. I mean, maybe it's just a good card and you just play it and you're very happy with it. Yeah, I mean, that's probably true too. It's like uh, this this could just be good on its face. You don't even have to do anything special with it. Well, let's see. Let's see what we'll try to get done. I have sounded the alarm though. Sacrifice another creature for free matters a lot. Keep a close eye on that. On to the red cards. Escape Velocity, R, Enchantment Aura, Enchant Creature, Enchanted Creature gets plus one plus zero and has haste. Escape, one R, exile two other cards from your graveyard. Brian, this card is nice. What are you up to with Escape Velocity? What are you trying to get done with this card? All your creatures have haste. I mean... it's it's The, the exile cards is super low cost, too. It is super low cost. The first creature has to die before that matters. You are investing an entire card into this in what I'm assuming is a very aggressive archetype. So you need to get returns on that investment. You can't afford to just be a card down. So I'm not quite sold on Escape Velocity yet. Maybe you'll show me something that makes me feel a little silly that I'm passing on this. As it stands, not excited about this card. This card will see play in standard. This card will also see quite a bit of play in Pioneer, I believe. Pioneer is interesting because there's obviously like prowess setups you can do and a cheap card that is repeatably castable from the graveyard matters a lot there. Oh, I was just thinking heroic, but yeah, I mean, prowess, escape. Let's let's put this in uh, Overturf's modern deck. Let's do it. Okay, I'll try it out. I'll see what it does for me. I don't know, man. This is a lot of investment for not all that much return. And you really have to be getting a lot from the escape value. And do you want the game to go that long where you're ever escaping this more than once? I don't think so. You don't want the game to go that long. But if the game is going that long, any card you draw is live. Any creature, excuse me. But we're already starting with a lot of hasty creatures, right? I mean, it's Soul Scar Mage will obviously benefit from picking this oh, up. Yeah. It, what, what format are we talking about? Modern? It depends. I, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Whatever format you want to talk about. No, oh, whatever. I mean, yeah, this is this is a card that you are able to play from the graveyard uh, for two mana, which is relatively cheap. And 
yeah, give your steam can or reveler haste or whatever. But yeah, in, in the context of standard, it's like, you know, I'll put this on my second one drop on turn two and just get in there and then try and clear your blockers, get in there. Eventually my creatures are going to die and then I'll draw like a war boss and give it haste or something, you know, like mm-hmm. this, this card is decent. Okay. Let's see what we have for one drops. I can wear this effectively. I, I do think when I was sketching heroic decks very early on, that was the missing puzzle. I haven't seen a huge one step up yet, but if we see a good one, I think I stay, escape velocity stock goes up quite a bit. Well, so for, for mono red in pioneer, there's a crow and crusader foundry street denizen monastery, Swiss spear. Oh my God. I don't uh, want to play any of these cards ever. Seder hoplite. And this, this is like the exact, like I've, I've played against a bunch of decks like that that are like trying to hammer hand me or whatever, you know, it's like, those mm-hmm. decks are fine. And I think that this, this helps them a lot, but whatever. Okay. More hammer hands. Dude, I love hammer hand. All right. Uh, Ox, <laughs> Ox of Agonis. Three RR creature Ox, obviously. Four, two. When this enters the battlefield, discard your hand, then draw three cards. Escape RR, exile eight other cards from your graveyard. Ox of Agonis escapes with a plus one, plus one counter on it. Again, it's like your invitational card or something? It, it, What's yeah, going it, on here? it basically is. It basically is. I I really wanted them to, to have it be escape six cards, but they said it was too strong and they nerfed it date. I believe that. Uh, this card seems awesome to me. Just completely awesome. A lot of the press around this card focuses around its appearance in Modern Dredge, which makes sense like if you have this and some other cards in your graveyard you're basically going to go off and uh go absolutely nuts yeah busted. so i understand i understand why we're hyped there obviously this has some similarities to things like bedlam reveler although it's locked on the front side at five mana probably too much to play this fair and modern but in standard i could buy this being a totally reasonable option yeah this being a top end for like rule or whatever is just completely fine or some bigger red deck but yeah if you're doing any sort of uh, red black stuff or even like, is it stuff really? Like if you're doing arc light Phoenix things, like you can mm. play a copy of this. Yeah. I buy that. What about fires? Does fires have any interest in buying into the ox? Yeah, probably you have so many good five drops already. It depends on what version, like if you're a Jess guy, it's like you would already max on the eight Cavaliers and Kenrith before this card, I think. Right. But right, if you're right, talking right. about doing like Jun stuff or red black stuff, I mean, yeah, I'm in. Okay. Well, we have talked a lot about reanimator on this podcast as well. Another card that sets up reanimation just fine is like a fine reanimation target in a bunch of spots and just getting you a little bit more gas out of your graveyard as the game goes on. So Ox looking pretty good there too. I like this card. Yeah. This is, this seems powerful. I understand why it got the mythic designation uh, another one where I want to know a little bit more about the surrounding context. I want to know how hard we can go on graveyards, but the power level certainly there. All right. Perforos, the one true God, according to Michael Majors, Bro- bronze blooded four R seven, six. That's large legendary enchantment creature. God indestructible. As long as your devotion to red is less than five. Perforos isn't a creature. Other creatures you control have haste, which matters a lot with this ability. 2R, you may put a red creature card or an artifact creature card from your hand onto the battlefield, sacrifice it at the beginning of the next end step. Wow. That is quite the effect. I haven't done the deep dive on older formats to know like what the best red or artifact creature card you can put in is. In standard, it's probably Dracoseth. There's also this flying double strike dragon as well that I see just a few cards over. Yeah. That... Could matter quite a bit as well. Terror of Mount Velus. Yeah, th- there's options to really get something out of this sneak attack ability in standard. And if you can lead towards that end game while still having a decent chance of just turning on Perforos and getting a big beater out of it, I think this card could certainly shine quite a bit in standard. Yeah, I mean, there's also Ilarg, right? So for five mana, you have a lot of redundancy. Right. Yeah, good it, point. I mean, yeah. I think I would want more than just Dracoseth, right? There's got to be like some other top end payoff. Yeah, I mean, what were we trying to Illurg before when that card came out? So long ago. When we believed cards like that to be playable, I, I can't even remember. Yeah, I don't know. 
I think Dracoseth has usually been like the ramp thing that we do. There's also a limitation here, of course, like you can only put in red creature cards or, or artifact creature cards. So that slows us down a little bit. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, do you like Storm Herald at all? Should we talk about that card? Yeah, I, I think we should talk about this card. All right, Storm Herald 2R32 Creature Human Shaman Haste. When this enters the battlefield, return any number of aura cards from your graveyard to the battlefield attached to creatures you control. Exile those auras at the beginning of your next instep. If those auras would leave the battlefield, exile them instead of putting them anywhere else. So if you are doing any sort of self milly thing or you are doing heroic stuff, you have some creatures, some auras chilling in the graveyard. This is potentially a very big finisher. It does not seem like a stretch to me to believe there can be a combo deck built around this card that just mills itself a bunch and then just one shots you. I don't, I don't know that it's tier one. I don't know that it's tier two even, but the setup is quite simple to figure out. There's a ton of ways to make this happen. There's decent payoffs. Like, I don't know what our biggest auras are in standard. There's all that glitters. So if you just have a bunch of them, you get paid really hard. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure there's like some huge aura floating around out there that we can leverage. I mean, we don't have Eldrazi conscription, but maybe we want to do that in older formats. Who knows? This is a powerful effect. It's not limited by mana. It's just limited by how many cards you can throw into your graveyard and how quickly you can get them there. So there are very fast kills, I think, available to you with Storm Herald. Yeah, this will be a nice, like, Mimi combo card, I think. Yep. That's my expectation. Uh, 2RR Sorcery. Uh, this deals four damage to each creature in each Planeswalker. Nice. Nice yeah. little staple card. Yeah, cool card. Uh, hitting yeah. hitting Planeswalkers is huge. For sure. And I hope that becomes the default mode of all these cards in the future because we would benefit greatly from having more ways of cleaning up Planeswalkers. Yeah. Of course, all their loyalties are so high now that four damage is unlikely to matter, but we can dream. We can dream. It's like, all right, I got all their Planeswalkers down to three loyalty. I almost did <laughs> right. it. Almost. I, I killed their two forests and now their Nisses at three. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds great. Underworld Breach, 1R Enchantment. Each non-land card in your graveyard has escape. The escape cost is equal to the card's mana cost, plus exile three other cards from your graveyard. At the beginning of the end step, sacrifice this. Clearly a very fair magic card. I have words to say about this magic card. First off, I already said my piece on escape. People undervaluing how hard it is to fuel escape. Second off... I do not want to see your Underworld underworld Breach deck in Legacy that kills on turn one. That is not impressive to me. There are a billion decks in Legacy that kill on turn one. Char if you draw the right hand. Yeah, play Char Belcher. Like, all I've seen is a bunch of people saying, uh, Brain Freeze, Lion's Eye Diamond, Underworld Breach, good game. Like, okay, you haven't done anything new here. This is completely plausible that there's fine setups for turn one kills in Legacy that don't go through any disruption or any kind of roadblocks whatsoever. It happens all the time. This isn't exciting. What would be exciting if you find a way to build an Underworld Breach deck, which has a little bit more disruption, uh, a little bit more self-protection, then okay, you start to get me on board. But what I have seen thus far, completely unimpressive, nothing that really excites me. There's potential for this card to be absolutely bonkers, though. Just work a little bit harder. Don't just show me Brain Freeze and say it's done, because that's nothing new for the Legacy format. This is weird, though. It'll take people a while to figure out. I don't have anything for modern yet, but this is probably where the card is most scary because there's potential for it to do more in modern at an earlier stage than we are used to. But I haven't figured it out yet. And it seems like everyone's just focused on Lion's Eye Diamond. And sure, Lion's Eye Diamond decks are good in Legacy. Who knew? Yeah, there's also just more Force of Wills now too. So yeah, Force of Negation is a big deal. You know, Belcher was main decking Pyroblast. Now I think it's main decking Veil of Summers. And yeah, a lot of the decks that people posted are just like, yeah, you can't beat a counterspell. You know, you know how often the Storm decks have to like duress me before they can try and kill me, you know? Like, yeah, they they do that. They have you know six to eight duresses in their deck or whatever. Uh, and they, they kill me on turn three all the time. But like, you have to disrupt me a bunch before you actually try and kill me. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm not even trying to be like negative about this card. I just saw people insisting this card is going to get banned because it can kill you in turn one on Legacy. Like, are you kidding me? That's that's not noteworthy. There's something here. This is a powerful effect, but you got to do more than that. Yeah, yeah. Set it up with 
disruption or protection, splice that combo with another combo, do slower build up things, maybe with like intuition and just have it be like a compact package. I don't know. There's there's other ways to go about things. Anyway, uh, last red card, Underworld Rage Hound, 1R, 3-1, Creature Elemental Hound, ooh, Elemental. This attacks each combat if able, that's downside. Escape, 3R, exile three other cards from your graveyard. This escapes with a plus one, plus one counter on it. You noted the most exciting point. It's another Elemental. If there's ever going to be an aggro Elementals deck, maybe this is part of it. Mm, three, one for two, fine stats, getting a rebuy on the escape. Also fine. Generally unexciting, but a little bit of potential here. Yeah. On to green. Uh, 1GG, 2-2, two, two, Human Druid. When this enters the battlefield, you gain life equal to your devotion to green. This is, in my mind, just a better Nylea's Disciple. I'm very happy about this card. Yeah, good card to have exist, and we'll see play, 100%. Satessin Champion, 2G, 1-3, Creature Human Warrior. Constellation, whenever an enchantment enters the battlefield under your control, put a plus one, plus one counter on this and draw a card. Did an article about this card. Uh, there's a lot this card has to overcome. Enchantresses generally need to do more these days to be good enough, but this card has the benefit of scaling very quickly, and there are good auras. Uh, we're going to get to one in a little bit, but against some decks, Satessin Champion plus thing on it is going to be an effective KO. Uh, and I think it's unlikely that this is good against the vast majority of decks, but it may prove to be an answer against certain setups. Oh, go it. We're still doing that. I I don't know. It's just funny to look at the cards that are like getting printed later. And it's like, oh yeah, this could never be no go. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, Nylea, something or other three G five, six legendary enchantment creature. God indestructible. As long as your devotion to green is less than five. This isn't a creature. Creature spells you cast cost one less to cast. 2G, reveal the top card of your library. If it's a creature card, put it into your hand. Otherwise, you may put it in your graveyard. This one is uh, pretty tame compared to the rest of them. Yeah, does this actually does this actually feel worse than the other gods? Is it possible that green got the shaft for the first time in Lord knows how long? Yeah, this, this card will probably end up busted somehow. <laughs> We're just totally wrong. It's by far the best one. Would not surprise me. No, I mean, it, it seems fine. This is not a card. Like, Erebos, you can, like, kind of build around. Heliod, you certainly build around. This is just, like, a card that you might play in your deck if the mana reduction matters and you need a mana sink. But that's about it. Tough for it to matter at the stage that this comes down. I, I don't know. I'm not excited about this card. It, I, I'm hard-pressed to think about the way green decks are now. What green deck benefits from this card? I don't know that I really see it right now. Well, it... It's a four mana five six, in theory, that in theory. has a mana sink ability, which like Duskwatch Recruiter type of stuff is good. Three mana flip a coin to see if you draw a card is not very good. Mm. Uh, you, granted, you do get like the scry action or surveil whatever, uh, so it's slightly better than that, but still. Yeah, it goes to your graveyard. Okay, that's something. I mean, big bodies with low evasion have a lot to overcome in this format because of what I perceive as the continued prevalence of Cat Oven. So that also takes some points off of this Nylea for me. Yeah, fair. I mean, Nylea could be your second big thing, which allows you to get through Cat Oven, right? Maybe. But whatever. I mean, there are a lot of options for that. Uh, On to Multicolored, we have Staggering Insight, U-Dub, Enchantment Aura, Enchant Creature gets... Plus one, plus one, and has lifelink, and whenever this creature deals combat damage to a player, draw a card. This is a a fixed, curious obsession, which basically just means it has, like, this extra tax on it to make it not actually as good, but might still see play. I don't know. I mean, like, even, like, two mana for plus one, plus one, and lifelink in the context of, like, oh, you want to do, like, these faux heroic things? Like, maybe this is a good enough card. Yeah, I mentioned Satessin Champion being able to shut off entire decks. Like, think about a Satessin Champion wearing a Staggering Insight against something like Mono Red. That seems like it's time to shine. But you're right. This is a much, much worse Curious Obsession. And it's funny that I heard people talk about it being a better Curious Obsession. The mana cost matters so, so much. Um, But this card's fine. It'll find some kind of aura-based home. 
the, so the mana cost matters, but also people are like, oh yeah, and it gets lifelink. But like, if you are connecting with your creature and drawing you cards, yeah. You, yeah, you really don't care. You're going to like brazen borrow their stuff and like counter their stuff, right? And most of those creatures had flying or some sort of evasion. We, we don't have a huge amount of good creatures with those abilities currently. Obviously, you could do the infinity one mana, one, one flyers deck. Like you have a bunch of those, but those weren't like siren storm tamer level good. You don't necessarily have dive down type of stuff. Like that deck was good because it had all one mana cards, you know, and very cheap mm. interaction and got under people. This doesn't really allow you to do that. Spot on. Ashiok Nightmare Muse, three, UB, Legendary Planeswalker, Ashiok, Loyalty, five, plus one, create a two, three, blue and black, Nightmare Creature token with, whenever this creature attacks or blocks, each opponent exiles the top two cards of their library. Minus three, return target non-land permanent to its owner's hand, then that player exiles card from their hand. Minus seven, you may cast up to three, Face up cards your opponents own from exile without paying their mana costs. So uh, five mana either gets to bounce their thing and make them exile a card, or you make a two, three token that has some value and you sit at six loyalty. Like I think that's a, a reasonable stat line, uh, but like, you know, compare this to Nissa or whatever. And obviously it's like, eh, this is not quite as scary if your opponent untaps with it, but you can see how this would run away with the game. Two years ago, we go absolutely bonkers about this card. Like, it absolutely blows our mind. Uh, things have changed dramatically once more with the addition of static abilities to Planeswalkers and just, like, bonkers three-mana Planeswalkers. So you need a lot from your five-mana Planeswalker. I do think this card is quite good. I think minus three return non-land permanent to its owner's hand. You're answering some things that blue-black should not be able to answer. Uh, you get a second chance at countering a key enchantment which is worth noting, or you can bounce something and then Thought Erasure. All those things are pretty good, and you're not doing it at card disadvantage because they also have to exile a card from their hands. So really cool setup. I think it's also pretty easy to get a lot of value from the ultimate. Like plus, plus, minus should happen a bunch of times, quite frankly, and it can be game-breaking. So I, I do like this card. I just think things have changed a lot as far as what we ask from our Planeswalkers. There's better Planeswalker answers starting to make their way into the format. Obviously, there is uh, Murderous Rider. There is also Vanishing Light returning. So I'm tempering my expectations for what this card actually does. But I think on its face, it's quite a good Planeswalker. We're just living in a different world these days. Yeah, I agree with all that. Uh, I would be very happy living in a world where I could play some blue-black mid-range nonsense with this card kind of as my top end. And yeah, kind of like bob and weave with the three different abilities, get a lot of value in a lot of different ways from this card. But I'm skeptical that we live in that world. Me too. But you're right. It plays a lot of game plans quite well. Uh, I just <laughs> don't think any of those game plans matter. Devourer of Memory, UB Creature Nightmare 2-1. Whenever one or more cards are put into your graveyard from your library, this gets plus one, plus one until end of turn and can't be blocked. Uh, this turn, one UB, put the top card of your library into your graveyard. Uh, not the most exciting card, but if you are doing like self milly things, like a two mana, three, two unblockable is not that bad. And if you get to trigger this multiple times in a turn, obviously that adds up too. But uh, what do you think about this thing? Uh, I mean, like we have a plant in Vantress Gargoyle that is set up for this type of aggro self mill deck. It feels pretty far off to me right now, but it only takes one or two good additions. And then you're dealing with cards that are quite good on rate. So need more prints, but I, I think it's worth calling attention to. It's a card that could potentially see play if it gets appropriate support. Yeah. Uh, Allure of the Unknown. We talked about this a little bit earlier. Three BR sorcery. Reveal the top six cards of your library and opponent exiles a non-land card from among them. You put the rest into your hand. That opponent may cast the exiled card without paying its mana cost. So they get the best card and the first crack at it, and they get it for free. Dude, why do you think this card is good? You have to work really hard at it, and you don't just get handed anything from a lore of the unknown. But once you accept that you're getting five cards for five mana, 
you are incentivized to work for it. And like I said, if you're doing it in devotion setups, the chances are they don't get as much value from your cards as you do. Uh, another thing I built around was like X spells. If all your spells have X in them, then a Lord of the Unknown is going to do almost nothing. There, There's weird little tricks you can get up to. I also think the Black Red Sacrifice decks actually do another really good job of taking advantage of this card because previously, if they assembled their stuff they were very, very strong decks. But if you disrupted them in any way, they just crumbled. They had no catch-up mechanism. Now you play Allure of the Unknown. The one random card you're going to hand your opponent is unlikely to matter. Basically, the best thing they could take is a Mayhem Devil. Yep. And you're going to tell me the other five cards you've taken from the top of your library don't have some way of dealing with a Mayhem Devil. There's no Claim the Firstborn. There's no piece of removal. Yeah, that's There's what I was going to say. Something. Is, is you get Claim and you just you take it for the turn and destroy them with it. So yep. it's kind of whatever. Enjoy. Yeah, I, I think there are ways to utilize this card and five cards for five mana leaves you wanting to try and figure those ways out. It's not going to come free though and you definitely have to work to get the payoff. Compare this to the other available five drops though. Like I think of uh, John Rolfe's Rakdos Sack Fires deck that had both Bontu and Cavalier of Flame or even just like Cavalier of Night. Depending on what you're trying to accomplish in any given format is this card going to be stronger than any of these yes. cards. Yes, in, in some spots I think it is. And that's part of the problem that really stood out to me with the black-red decks is that those cards you're talking about are tremendous when you're ahead, but you've had to set up your engine as you've gone on and you already have your Mayhem Devil on the battlefield and you've done damage early and now your Bantu matters. But if you've just had all of your threats answered effectively and you're playing a Bantu with five lands in play, I mean, that card's fine. I would rather just have the huge refill, though, and try and reestablish an engine as opposed to use these one, one-shot one fixes, which really weren't getting the job done. So they're different cards. It asks you to do something very different with your deck. Again, if you look at the black-red decks, they didn't get the job done. These setups did not work. There was a flaw to them. And I think that flaw was they just couldn't play from behind. This card gives them something to do now. To be fair, if you are... I, I don't think this is necessarily what you mean, but if you are behind and you cast this card, you've skipped your turn to accomplish nothing and they get your best right, card, right, right. right? So you're so, even more behind now. I, I think you're saying like you have been exhausted of resources from like a correct. mid-range or a control deck, right? So like you're still a parity, you just don't have a lot of resources. In, yes, that is more the scenario I'm talking about. Yeah, so in, in the situations where you're actually behind, Bantu and Cavalier of Flame can get you some additional cards, and certainly, you know, Bantu, if you have nothing else going on, like you're going to have to sack a couple lands. Obviously, that doesn't necessarily help your cause. But if you have some lands in your hand, then Cavalier of Flame is perfectly fine with that. Uh, or if you have like food lying around, oven you don't need, whatever. You can translate those into resources while also making a body. That's that's why I'm just like, well, if we're talking about like strictly being behind, then I still think that the thing that puts a body into play is better. Sure, I, I see your point in your but, scenarios. But yeah, but di there's different scenarios. I agree. Like if right. you're if you're looking for a raw raw card drawing thing, I think this is good. But I also would rather just play something like Midnight Reaper. Yeah, I mean that card's good. Look, I mean <laughs> my job in these early stages is to figure out what we can do with these cards. Is there anything new? A Lore of the Unknown offers. I do think there is something new. It is bringing to the table. It's not clear to me that that's something new is going to be better than what already exists, but I'm going to explore and figure that out. Yeah. No, I mean, I think it is cool to look at a card like this and be like, how do I break the, I mean, it's not symmetry with this. It's like just downside, right? Like it is very clearly double downside for you, maybe triple downside, right. depending on how you want to look at it. But, you know, you're thinking outside the box for how to make this card good. And I certainly appreciate that. but. Also, like five mana draw five would probably not be good in this format. So I don't know. This is part of the appeal of old magic that keeps striking me throughout this set where I'm like, I know, oh, man. this would be so good 10 years ago. <laughs> I know. All right. Gruel, homie. One GR, four, four, creature, Minotaur, warrior, trample. This can't attack unless you control another creature with power four or greater. For Gruel, maybe not that big of a deal. Yeah, th there's better ways to do this, I think. Yeah, I mean, you, you have Spellbreaker and Warboss at three mana already. Uh, th there's maybe a world where uh, Warboss is worse than this thing. 
Yeah, I don't know. Maybe, like, obviously, this this works a little bit better with like ember cleave type of stuff, right? It just has more power, so it has something like that going for it. Yeah. Also, your pelt collectors are more apt to get larger, so sure. There's reasons to consider this card. I just think it's going to be outclassed by other options in most instances. Yeah. Galia of the Endless Dance, GR, legendary creature, Seder, 2-2, haste. Other satyrs you control get plus one, plus one, and have haste. Whenever you attack with three or more creatures, you may discard a card at random if you do draw two cards. I really like the second line, or the third line, I guess. Yeah, that effect's super powerful. Uh, I, I don't know how many other satyrs we're going to get. I don't think there's any presently. And I don't know if this is a card where that part of the card has to matter in order for this to be good enough. But that clause on the last line, that seems really strong to me. I would imagine that two mana, two, two haste gets outclassed very quickly. I mean, we've seen the Zertog goblins uh, get cast like that. And it's like, ah, I should have made this a three robber three. of the rich. Yeah, robber that of the rich comes to mind. Yep, that one, too. But this has the benefit of being able to kind of chill for a little bit until you actually have a battlefield with three or more creatures and then you can attack with multiple things at once and and trigger this and you know maybe you draw an ember cleave off the trigger or whatever and then galia gets to eat the thing that tried to eat her in combat so i don't know it's it's possible that this is like a one or a two of uh and yeah maybe there are other satyrs and there's some satyr that you really want to give haste or whatever i don't know but uh this is worthy of consideration at least what do you think of the discard being random? Interesting little wrinkle. Yeah, I would imagine that you are mostly using this after you have played your best cards, right? So sure. it's probably not going to matter all that much or you have a decent amount of big things in your hand and are searching for lands or whatever. So it, it's like desperate ravings to me. It's like, I don't really care. I'm just going to use it in a way or try to use it in such a way where the, the random discard is not super punishing. It's also nice that this card itself doesn't has, have to attack in order to get the benefit. It could be just three other random creatures. Oh. So I did not intuit that, but uh, it, it does make sense. I guess, yeah, it's just upside that she can be one of the creatures. Right. Yeah, that's cool. This this could also, yeah, just be a, a card drawing thing that sort of chills in play while you attack with three tentacle tokens or whatever you got going on. Sounds good. Uh, another gruel card, Clothis, God of Destiny, 1GR45, legendary enchantment creature, God, indestructible. As long as your devotion to red and green is less than seven, Clothis isn't a creature. At the beginning of your pre combat main phase, exile target card from a graveyard. If it was a land, add R or G. Otherwise, gain two life, and this deals two damage to each opponent. I like the recurring damage. Uh, the gruel devotion thing is relevant for the last two cards that we talked about. Mm -hmm. so that's that's a thing too where maybe you play those cards instead of quote unquote stronger options because it helps enable your god uh so yeah either this ramps you to five and or just consistently deals them damage and like gains you life like this seems solid yeah recurring indestructible damage source is a really nice pickup for aggressive decks and the fact that this turns on sometimes i i think i buy this card kind of wholeheartedly i think this could be quite good also keep in mind like the gruel decks often go quite high in their curve and are happy to ramp to five mana in a lot of spots. Now you have to get pretty lucky. Like I think you need to fabled passage to ever have that happen, but it could, it could go down that way and you could end up with your five drop in play a little bit earlier than you're expected. Yeah. Weird thing that may or may not come up with this is main phase, a hard cast Ember cleave to enable mm. Clothis to become a creature. And then you Ember cleave the Clothis and attack them. That doesn't sound too bad. Yeah, that could happen. Uh, next up, we have an Orzov card, Athros Shroud Veiled, 4-7, or 4-dub-b, 4-7. Legendary enchantment creature, god, indestructible. As long as your devotion to white and black is less than 7, this isn't a creature. At the beginning of your end step, put a coin counter on another target creature. Whenever a creature with a coin counter on it dies or is put into exile, return that card to the battlefield under your control. Well, Jerry, this is the uh, buy a box promo, so this is not oh really intended for stand. It's not intended for standard play, so we don't have to worry about it. We can just move on. It's no. What you mean is it's the buy a box promo, so it's probably busted. Oh right, that's how we do that now. <laughs> no, I actually think this one is fine. This feels way more commandery to me than 
the last few BioBox promos have. So good job. Way to, way to get this one at the right power level. Yeah, so you, you play this for six mana. It has good stats, but is obviously difficult to enable. But by the time you have six mana, maybe it is just on. And then the coin thing is slow, but obviously super powerful and could take over a game. But needs a lot of time. Needs a lot of time. And I th- a lot of the cards in the set are just kind of like designed to kill you, you know, which I like. Mm-hmm. So I don't, I don't think you've got a lot of time. Right there with you. I'm glad to hear this is the buy box promo, though, because I was not aware of that. I hope I'm right about that. I mean, I'm probably just saying nonsense and I got it wrong. But for whatever reason, this is sticking to my head as the buy box promo. Kunaros, Hound of Athreos, 1WB, 3-3, Legendary Creature Hound, Vigilance, Menace, Lifelink. Creature cards in graveyards can't enter the battlefield. Players can't cast spells from graveyards. Three heads, three abilities. That's how we do things now. It, it's top-down questing is, beasts, man. Yeah, this card is fine. I, I mean, again, go back 10 years and I'm really into this card. Um, all these abilities together look really good. But ultimately, this is a three-mana creature that comes down and doesn't have immediate impact Uh, certainly does a good job at holding the fort for you against any kind of aggressive small deck but in general aggressive small decks these days tend to be evasive and uh, if they're not evasive they're bigger than three three and do a good job answering something like kuneros so i think you have to start thinking about eternal formats and is there a place for this to be viled in and effectively hit on graveyards three mana seems a little bit too high in eternal formats so while i like the combination of abilities here this card was initially exciting i think this one's gonna miss actually i think this is a solid role player for some sort of like orzov mid-range deck but definitely in in modern i think i like this card although Orzov is not a great color combination, but there are like the Eldrazi and Taxes decks where like this is a very mm-hmm. relevant card. We're not we're not playing Eldrazi and Taxes. I'm just actions saying, per turn. Actions not, per listen, turn. Do more actions. One, play Urza until they take it away from you. I said one, six months ago, VTCLA has now one of Mox taking that advice. Play Urza until they take it away from you. Uh, I'm playing Richmond in a month. I believe I'm in the modern seat. I want to play Bant Stoneblade. Oh my god. Dude, it's really it, good. It, it is. It's really good. Do you know what's broken, though? Or is uh, it's broken? Yeah, it's fine, though. Okay. You do you. All right, so here's here's the deal. Cedric wants to play in GP Austin. He's going to come to my house and get my Urza cards. If Cedric does well in the Grand Prix, then I will play Urza. Okay. Put your fate in Cedric's hands. What could go wrong? Well, no, I'm just saying like, if, if even Cedric can win with it. <laughs> <laughs> this is how I used to use my brother, by the way. Sorry, Justin, oh, if you're yeah. listening to this. That's gas. I, yeah, I would just build the deck, and if he started winning with it, I'm like, yeah, this deck's gas. I'm definitely playing this. You did that with uh, Jared Betcher, though, too, I believe. I did, but that often led to some very, very flawed results, surprisingly. I, I'm not it's, really sure why I would get yeah, weird data. It is weird. Yeah. Sorry. I, I try not to bring that up very often, but this one, it, it was too good of an opportunity. It it lines up very well. I can't deny that. All right, next Lotus. Four mana, legendary artifact. This enters the battlefield tapped. Tap, choose a color. Add an amount of mana of that color equal to your devotion to that color. Uh, I assume this means that Nykthos is not getting reprinted as many people thought? Uh, I don't know. I'm not willing to make that call yet. Nykthos is a very, very powerful magic card. It's not good to have lands that produce multiple mana, so I'm fine if we just pass on that and go with Nyx Lotus instead. Uh, but this card isn't apt to do anything in standard, I don't think, unless it just goes absolutely huge. But with Nissa existing, I feel like the space to go absolutely huge is always going to be occupied by that card. And you don't need to go down a Nyx Lotus route. What I mean, what if we just have two Nissas, dude? It's a lot of Nissas. Uh, is, it's a lot of mana. Is there a good non manifold key way to untap Nyx Lotus? Corridor monitor. I said good. No, that's that's all I've got for you, Corridor Monitor. There might be something else. We haven't had to look for anything like that. But yeah, that's what this card will do. If it does anything, it's just going to be about jamming a bunch of effects together and going absolutely tremendous. I'm I'm ready to bring back the Grazers. What, did they go anywhere? 
Well, yeah, I mean, people stop playing them. Uh, I, I am playing Grazer presently, but e. I'm probably a madman, so. E. Just farming farming all those Knights decks that are all over Magic Arena. Okay. Other stuff we have are allied, allied colored temples. Yay. Cool. Yeah, uh, I love temples. Love temples. Love there being balance in the dual land distribution in the format. Still am not super pleased with the like the the options available to us. Temples are not aggro friendly, which is kind of awkward. But hey, better better these than nothing. And then Field of Ruin is also back. And welcome back. A little late, Field of Ruin. Do we unban Field of the Dead now? Can we have it back? No, no, Brian. Oh. No, okay. Brian. Uh, yes, a little late. And I don't know, maybe this card should just be evergreen. I don't know. I think so. I think this is a card that should always be around. It does good things for formats. But yeah, that's it. That's all we got. Two hours of previews. Theros. Uh, it, it looks good, man. There's a lot of stuff that I'm excited to build around, excited to get my grubby hands on and play with. And I don't I don't see any Okos, but could be wrong. Don't see any yet. I'm with you. This set has excited me thus far. I've built a bunch of decks. I mentioned on Twitter a few days ago, I was kind of doing a Magic 2020 in review. I might actually do a YouTube video because I have a lot to say about it. And I don't want to write it all because I'm lazy. I'd rather just yell it at you. But I think that in 2019, they did a fantastic job of when we sat down to do these set reviews, I was always excited. Now, granted, I love magic cards, so most instances I'm going to be very excited. But I do think they're still making really, really exciting magic cards and doing a great job of that. And that's really the test. Like You have to be able to do that consistently. And when I start worrying about the game, it's when they're messing that up. What I think they messed up in 2019 were some of the numbers and some of the play patterns. And you can understand how occasionally those things are going to get away from you. I think that with as much history as magic has, sometimes there's just going to be mistakes and there's nothing wrong with that. As long as you recover well, I think Theros has a bunch of powerful cards. It has a bunch of exciting cards. I am hoping that it is lacking in the mistake department. And thus far, uh, I mean, nothing on its face seems problematic there. I don't have any of the reactions that I had to say something like once upon a time where I'm just like, Oh my God, what are we doing here? I haven't done that yet. So that that's a good starting point for this new set. Yeah, I agree. I'm right there with you. I'm I'm excited by a lot of this stuff. I feel like things are pushed on rate to the point to get me excited, and they have succeeded mm-hmm. in doing that. But there's nothing where I'm just like, oh, whoa, this is this is definitely too good. Yep. But you know, obviously that'll change when we get some of the. Well, not it definitely will change, but it could change when we get the cards in our hands. It could. And, it could. And I think more important than that is even the, like the play patterns, like what type of games of magic are we going to be playing? And that's something you just don't know until you get into the format. But I'm keeping my expectations high, as I always do for magic. Most times we are rewarded with a fun game, a game that I want to play above all others. I have no reason to believe that won't be the case again. Right there with you. So to wrap up the show every week, we solicit the fine folks in our discord uh, for their burning questions, uh, we asked for things about Theros Beyond Death and preview season in general and what they wanted to know. And uh, DT Lurch wants to know, looking back, what's the first time you remember seeing a preview card from a new set and feeling excited? My answer is interesting because it wasn't actually a fully formed preview card, but Going back to, I mean, I don't know what year this was. I guess it would be 1995. In the Duelist, before a new set came out, on like the last page, there would be a little blurb about the cards they would reveal to you in the next month. And I remember the little blurb prior to Mirage saying things like a zero mana artifact that can be tapped and sacrificed for three mana and a one mana 12-12 And I remember just absolutely losing my mind, like totally believing in my heart of hearts that Black Lotus was coming back (laughs) and being over the moon about it. I was very, very young and dumb. Don't judge me, Jerry. But I would get so hyped off these little blurbs. And I I think, I think, I don't know this for sure. I would love if someone who has 
old duelist would go and take a look at this. But I think it was Mark Rosewater who actually wrote those little blurbs because he continued to do things like that for years and years. Okay. And I think it's a really cool way of talking about magic cards that haven't been released yet, like leaving away all of the uh, hurdles and things like that and just getting people absolutely hyped about the possibilities and what it could mean to get a card that has this ability on it. And then we got Lion's Eye Diamond, and we were all so disappointed, just absolutely heartbroken that we had this worthless card that we would never use, probably proxied all over them oh, just yeah. to teach them a lesson. Oh, yeah. Those those were just like it, – it was it was like the one with nothing of the oh, time, yeah. right? Yep. Hated it. Yeah. And well, I mean, that's probably why it's like $150 now. It's because a Mm -hmm. lot of them are just in trash cans. Yeah, just threw them away. And yeah, there was there was no rarity stamp on it either. It wasn't like, you know, oh, I know this is a rare. Very true. Uh, Yeah, that's that's interesting. It's especially funny to me that you would get to the end of this issue and they would have the blurbs about that stuff. And you're like, all right, time to wait 30 more days until the next issue comes <laughs> right. out. Like Different world, man. Really different world. Yeah. Now, if I'm just like, all right, who was that one guy in that one movie? I just immediately go on my phone and Google it. Like, I'll tell you what was extra messed up about it, though, is that I lived in the middle of nowhere and my parents wouldn't like bring me to the mall, which was an hour away with any kind of regularity. Like I would go once every three to four months. I relate so to I that. would go and hope that they still had old duelists that I could buy and they hadn't sold out of them because I wanted this information so badly. And you would just catch up on the back issues. I would. I, I would read anything I could get my hands on relating to magic. 100% whatever I could find was coming home with me. That is awesome. So for me, I don't remember explicitly when I first started looking at previews. Uh, I was born in 84 and I didn't get the internet until 2001 or 2002. Uh, So like when I was 18, basically. So uh, granted, my friend who got me into magic, Adam Gunderson, showed me that I could instead of like going to lunch during high school, I could go to the library and like, you know, these are the magic sites that you should go to. And like, this is how you find articles and all this stuff. And then I would just like print off a bunch of like mind ripper articles and read them during class. Uh, so I kind of had access during high school, but it, it wasn't to the same degree now where it's, you know, I get to look at 10 different magic websites per day, whenever I want. Of course. Yeah. But uh, invasion pre-release was my first tournament. I don't know that like how much I knew going into that, but I think the first tournament I remember like actually being excited about the cards was probably Apocalypse. Like Plane Chase was pretty tame and it's like, oh, Meddling Mage is sweet or whatever. But like Apocalypse was the one where it's like Pain Lands, like enemy color Pain Lands and Pernicious Deed and Spirit Monger and Vindicate. Spirit Monger, yeah. I'm Just, sure you're over the moon about Spirit Monger. Just all of these cards that were seemingly busted, you know, just like straight busted in half. So I don't know that it was like any one individual card, but certainly Apocalypse, like the entire set, because it was like the first time they had ever done enemy colored anything really like as a theme. Right. It just did not have the support back then. So it was very, very sweet to now have like Vindicate, Gerard's Verdict and a white black dual land. And it, all, all bets are off, you know, like you could, you could just build basically, you know, five new color combinations just based on this one set that had a ton of power in it. And it was very exciting. That's cool, man. Magic's so awesome. I love magic so much. Like for all the complaining I do, you wouldn't believe how much I truly in my heart of hearts love magic. Just there's so many stories and so many moments of excitement that it's given me throughout my life and reflecting back on these past preview seasons certainly fills me with a lot of that. Yeah, of course. You know, new new cards get up or get get posted, and this is like I'm waking up in the morning. I'm I'm still, you know, like can barely open my eyes or whatever. My mind's all groggy, whatever, and I'm still like going to Scryfall to like look at the cards and read them because it's like the first thing I want to do, you know, and like 100. percent Maybe I'm not hit with that same amount of childhood joy and excitement but a lot of it is because i've been desensitized through years and years of preview seasons right it's like you know what if what if you got christmas three times a year or four times a year like obviously it would lose some of its luster if if you're 
you know, a five-year-old child or whatever. And this is like the first Christmas you remember and you got like a big Tonka truck or whatever, right? Like that's, that's the greatest thing in your life up until that point. And then if it happens every day, then it starts to be less special. Uh, so yeah, after, Very true. after 15 years of that, it's like, I I'm, I'm still excited by it. And I all, am also like more knowledgeable, which means that I can cross things off the list as far as like whether or not they're actually viable. So it kind of like dampens my excitement to some degree. Yeah. I'm glad I don't have to worry about that. All these cards are just unfettered possibilities to me. I, I see them and I'm like, Ooh, draw five. I'm in. Let's go. 100%. I mean, I, so I still see that and it's like, oh, how, how do I break this? Right. And it's like an, an exercise, but I don't have any notions of like, oh, I'm going to show up to the first PT a month after the set's released and, you know, break it with this card or whatever. It's like, I know that that stuff isn't going to happen. And that was kind of like one of the big uh, driving factors back in the day. So sure. Things are just different now. Uh, it's better in a lot of ways, worse in some ways, but it just kind of is what it is. And I don't know, man, uh, I'm, I'm still, still liking preview season, still liking magic. It's not going anywhere. Yeah. Right there with you. Can't wait to do our top 10 show. And I'm sure we're going to nail it with our new collaborative approach. I hope everyone comes back and listens to that show. Yeah. Two weeks. Uh, otherwise uh, there are a lot of modern events coming up. So probably modern next week. And I, believe, I think so. I believe that's it. That's game. Good luck.